Welcome to the One Learn Podcast. I'm your host, Francis Tapon. Did you know that Barack Obama called Libya a quote unquote shit show? And that he also called it the worst mistake of his presidency. That's just one of the things that you'll learn about in the book, The Burning Shores Inside the Battle for the New Libya by Frederick Weirly. I interviewed the author, Frederick Weirly, and this is what this podcast is all about. We want to find out a little bit more about Libya than you see on the headlines. He spent a lot of time in Libya, even during the war. In fact, Libya is still not that stable as of March, end of March 2019. I recorded this several months ago. This podcast is still quite relevant. So enjoy it, this insight into Libya. Welcome, everybody, to the Wander Learn Podcast. This is Francis Tapp, and I'm here with Fred Weary, who is a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He has a PhD from Oxford University in international relations, and he's also in Middle Eastern studies at Princeton. And he is an expert about Libya. He's just uh, written a book uh, called Burning Shores. Welcome. Thanks so much for having me. We really want to dive into everything about Libya in this uh, episode, and you kind of set out at the beginning of the book, Fred, where you basically, I'll quote you, you said, this book is try, tries to find the turning points and the missteps that caused the splintering of Libya, which I believe was not preordained after the death of, the dict- of its dictator. Ultimately, I want to understand what it was that caused revolutionaries to turn against one another. And you definitely achieve that in your book. And I wanted to see... If you could somehow summarize, what do you think, where did they, what were some of the key steps where they went wrong and where they went down this path, which you did not feel was inevitable? That's right. Those are, those are great points. Um, I think, you know, I really wanted to, to challenge this, this notion that Libya's, or at least this notion in the West, that Libya's history stopped in 2011 after the revolution and the intervention, and that after that, it became an unintelligible mess. Uh, you know, it just evolved into chaos. And I and I wanted to show that Libyans had agency. That there were um, there were real people involved that were trying to wrestle with their political fates. That were wrestling with the legacy of of Gaddafi's uh, dictatorship. Um, there were also missteps by the international community. To, so to really tell the story of what happened, you know, after the revolution. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, the, the first year after the revolution was, was absolutely critical. This was a key window of opportunity to consolidate uh, the gains of the revolution. And, and there were just a lot of missed opportunities and missteps. I think the, a, a real dilemma was, was the holding of elections um, after the revolution. And there's a lot of debate in the, in the literature about whether holding elections so soon after a conflict um, leads to a, a return to conflict. And this was a, a hugely thorny issue because obviously Libyans wanted the elections. You had a transitional uh, government that, that lacked legitimacy, so you needed to install a government with a popular mandate. Now, those elections went off transparently and well, but the problem was afterwards – Libyans had no real experience in self-governance. Um, they didn't, you know, I mean, we're talking about a society that for 42 years was totally devoid of, of political institutions, of civil society. And in some sense, they were, um, you know, they were set up to fail after that. Um, the parliament really fell victim to factionalism. Um, so you had this elected body that quickly, quickly dissolved. Um, the other, I think, major misstep or turning point was the inability to address Libya's militias and its armed groups. Um, and here the, the fault lies with both the Libyans and the international community where you never really had an army under Gaddafi. Um, you had these elite paramilitaries, but you didn't really have a security sector. And so during the revolution, you had these militias arise, and after the revolution, they grew in number. 
um, because the Libyan government started paying uh, paying the militias. So, of course, that caused them to mushroom. So you had a very fragile democracy, and then you had these militias, these armed groups. And, and I think those twin dynamics were really the recipe uh, for, for disaster. And we could talk about some other uh, missteps. I mean, Libya fell victim to regional intervention by outside powers who were playing a, a proxy game, and that happened uh, a bit later in, in 2014. It reminds me a bit of Yugoslavia in some ways, because back in that day, it was it really shows how not all conflicts are black and white. I think Americans especially, but everybody kind of likes these black and white conflicts where it's evil empire versus good empire, um, you know, communist versus capitalist or something like that. It's just good and bad. But just like Yugoslavia was kind of a mess and all sorts of different factions, the same story is kind of in Libya, isn't it? That's a very interesting parallel. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you have to remember we we didn't have a long acquaintance with this country. Our embassy had only returned um, in the in the mid two thousands, um, and so we were really trying to understand the players. Um, it's it's an obviously very complex place, despite the fact that for so long it was personified by this this central figure, this dictator Muammar Gaddafi. But of course. Beneath the surface, there were, there was a contending array of of towns, militias, tribes, regional differences, and of course, as you mentioned, um, those complexities did not lend themselves to a, a black and white um, division. And certain Libyan political actors were trying to, you know, portray themselves as the good guys, and and obviously, you know, those narratives had some traction in the West. But I think. As you rightly pointed out, um, you know, this this dichotomous division really didn't hold true. Yeah. And it's it's a shame. And, and one of the things I really respect you, Fred, because, I mean, you've you've testified in front of the Senate. You've also went to Benghazi many times, even during the war. Um, you speak Arabic. You have a great understanding of the country and realizing that there is a lot of nuance to it. And I think one of those nuances is Gaddafi himself, he is sometimes portrayed as just a terrible human being and, and as a dictator. But in fact, as you point out in the book, he raised literacy up to 82 percent. He gave out free health care. He stopped polygamy. He stopped child marriage. Um, he was the first person in 1998. I didn't know this. You pointed out in your book um, that he was the first person to have an Interpol arrest warrant for Osama bin Laden before anybody else. These are, you know, things that I think a lot of the public don't know about Muammar Gaddafi, and yet uh, we're kind of uh, ignorant about this stuff. Right. I mean, well, when he came to power, he was part of this this wave of, of Arab leaders in the, I mean, really starting in the 50s, but all the way up to the late 60s that, um, you know, that were modernizers. And, you know, they, many of them had military backgrounds and they did, you know, in fact, try to advance oh. the country. Um, you know, as you mentioned, in terms of literacy. And so when you talk to Libyans, yeah, in the first first years of Qaddafi's rule, there there were these improvements. But then, you know, very quickly um, later on, it, be, it became a kleptocracy. It became one man rule. Um, he ruled it as, as sort of an economy of plunder. Um, we know how he devolved power to his sons. He, he did ha- later on have this disastrous experiment with socialism and, and collectivization of wealth um, that, that just ruined um, ruined the Libyan economy. And, and I think, as I mentioned, just deprived Libyans of any experience in self-governance. And he also sponsored terrorism. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, of course. I mean, that's, that's what he's well known for in the West. Uh, Ronald Reagan famously called him the mad dog of the Middle East because he he supported these various militant groups uh, across the Middle East, in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, as I'm sure you're aware, and, and you know, even in places like Ireland or Northern Ireland. Now, one of the things that you mention is that the, in one of your articles, you talk about the Sufis. Now, I, went in, I was in Comoros. I've met Sufis in uh, uh, different parts of Africa. And one thing they keep telling me is that the Sufis, which are kind of the mystical arm of Islam— they say, we've never had a terrorist. And I wasn't sure, and you don't really talk about that in your book. And since you do know more about Sufis, and certainly I do, 
Um, do you, what is your take about that? You kind of compare them to the Salafism with the Sufis and the Salafists are kind of the more aggressive, typically, uh, the more terrorist prone, but is it that black and white or have the Sufis also partaken in some terrorists themselves? I don't believe terrorism. No, I mean, I mean, um, but they're not entirely, you know, peaceful. I mean, they are, as you mentioned, uh, they do have this mysticism, they have strong social roots in Libya, especially in Eastern Libya, where you had this this um, proto state, the Senussi dynasty, that had a heavy Sufi influence. But you know, they I mean, they they did play a strong military role in fighting the Italian colonial o- occupation. So they they took up arms. Um, you know, a person can be a Sufi and still um, you know be a fighter. But but when we talk about Libya's you know hardcore um, you know, terrorists or militants that went to go g- do jihad, those those are not Sufis. They came from an entirely different um, Islamic current of Salafi jihadism. Let's talk now about the 13 Hours book and movie. I just want to get your expert opinion about it because I enjoyed both. I read the book and I also saw the movie and it seemed pretty good, but I, I don't know if maybe it's it's missing huge chunks of information. Now you talk about the, those 13 hours and which is when Christopher, uh, the, the ambassador Stevens, uh, and the, it's not, it's not really the consulate, but basically was attacked in Benghazi. And then he died there. Those critical 13 hours. What is your take about the movie and the book? Well, I, I confess I haven't seen the movie. Um, and I, uh, you know, the book, as I understand it is, is a faithful account of, of the perspective of, of some, you know, the key uh, special operators that night. Um, and I think their account is corroborated by what we've seen from the trial of the key suspect in the attack, uh, Ahmed Bukatala, where some of those individuals um, testified as well. The question is one of, of, I think, nuance and context. I mean, the, the, what, what is missing, I think, from that account is the Libyan perspective that night. Libyans who were bystanders, who were there, the Libyans who tried to help the Americans that night, who, many of whom I interviewed, um, the, 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 the lead up to the attack, and then especially the aftermath of the attack. And that's what I really, you know, try to, try to capture that, um, you had the tragic death of these these four Americans, but the aftermath continued to reverberate um, in Libya and especially in the city of Benghazi. Right. And how is the city now in 2018? The city now is recovering from three plus years of, of warfare um, and vast portions of its historic downtown are in rubble. Um, by some accounts, the destruction is worse than what it suffered in the Second World War. So you've you've got a real tragic, um, you know, uh, deterioration in the city and and destruction of some very historic uh, buildings, old Italian buildings. You have massive di- displacement; people have dis- been displaced from their homes. So there's this real rupturing of the city's social fabric, but. In many senses, sense it's it's recovering. Um, there's normalcy. You can go to shopping malls. There are sporting games. There's soccer matches. There are youth clubs. There are um, tech startups. The university, which was closed during the fighting, is is restarting. So, you know, in 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 many areas, it is safe on the streets, and and you know, people are going about their lives, but not ready for tours yet. Intrepid tourists like yourself, maybe, but, um, you know, I, I, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, uh, there's hotels opening, um, but you know, they're, they are trying to attract, um, investment and, and the return of, of, of foreigners. Yeah. I tried to get a visa to go across Libya and every single time they told me, no, you can only do it with a business visa. And then even then they didn't want to do it. I, I tried the embassy in, it was in Algiers, in Algeria, and they they made it sound it was no problem, but in the end it was a problem. Then I tried again in the Tunisian embassy of, of Libya, and there they basically said, you know, it's crazy, don't try to do it. This was uh, November, end of November 2017. And so in the end, just because they discouraged me, and 
I think I could have made it, but again, my worry was just that there's just maybe a couple of checkpoints where they would get me and say, okay, and then pull me aside. Who knows? Because when you're traveling across these checkpoints, that's where trouble could happen. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the problem is often the sort of bureaucratic disorganization of of Libya right now. And then, you know, as you mentioned, there are, you know, the government's not entirely in control. There's different, you know, militias and this sort of thing. So. I think it's easier to fly into a particular city, stay in that city and then fly out instead of crossing the entire country. Yeah, absolutely. That I mean, that raises a good point about Libya today is that you have the sort of breakdown of certain cities uh, into sort of almost autonomous you know, city state. So uh, like, absolutely. I mean, traveling from, from one city to another is, you know, you're sort of crossing into semi-autonomous uh, zones in some sense. Now, Obama called Libya a shit show and he said it was his worst mistake as, you know, as you quoted in your book. I was wondering, just looking at it from the outside, a lot of people will say, you know, but this is the same thing that's happened in so many places in the Middle East. You had um, Saddam Hussein, who went down, and then he was a stable dictator, but then everything went to shit after he left or after he died. And then same thing with Mubarak and same thing in Libya. And so many times people are looking at this stuff. And, and of course, right now, as we speak, there's kind of not a revolution, but there's certain reform and changes going on in Saudi Arabia. And there's got to be thinking that if the kingdom there falls, that it could just be another shit show going on. So can we ever get this right? It's, I mean, not that it's 100% America's fault, but it, it sometimes is, 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 we would like to have like one good story coming out of the Middle East where, where we have come democracy, peace after getting rid of the dictator, but it always seems to go down in flames. Right. Well, that's because, uh, I mean, that's really a function of these, these authoritarian, you know, dictatorships that have, um, you know, deprive their societies, play different factions off against one another. And so they haven't set themselves up for anything to follow. Um, you know, there's this notion that these these dictatorships are, you know, sort of holding back things, are, are stable. Yes, they are stable, but it's a, it's a false stability. And it's always destined to blow, I think. And when it does blow, the aftermath is, is horrendous. Um, and there's not much to follow it. Now, in the case of Obama, his quote <clears throat> was really referring to the the lack of follow up, um, you know, after the intervention. He acknowledges that the, that the Americans uh, underestimated the depth of tribal divisions in the country, and so, you know, I think that was a failure to recognize, as you mentioned, the enormity of of reconstructing these societies, and he did not invest. American resources in that. He did not want to commit America to another nation building exercise as we'd done in Iraq. Um, and there was this uh, desire to hand off the post conflict reconstruction to the Europeans and the United Nations. And for various reasons, they, they couldn't do it. So, um, yeah, as you mentioned, I mean, the, the aftermath is just one more example of how, how interventions now, you go say awry. At the end of the book. You say succinctly, what is needed? You say, quote, a new social contract drawn up by Libyans themselves. What do you mean by that, a new social contract drawn up by the Libyans themselves? Well, I mean, this, this really reflects my, my belief that Libyans really have to, to drive the process. There's the United Nations is shepherding a process right now of national reconciliation. There are proposed elections. Um, but what we're really talking about is a, is a country that has to arrive at some understanding of its politics, um, how it's going to share resources, um, and I think especially how it's going to devolve power um, to the local level. I think because one fault of Gaddafi is that this was a hyper-centralized regime. He concentrated power in the capital. And so when you go across Libya, you find that, that, you know, these various regions, these towns, these ethnic groups, they want a measure of control over their, their affairs, over their budgets. They're not talking about complete breakdown or separation, but they're just talking about um, the sorts of things that, you, that we would take for granted in a, in a federal system. So, the, you know, the social contract is really an expression to, to underscore that, that Libyans have to have ownership of this, that it can't be um, imposed, um, from the outside. And that, 
that social contract was was missing in under the dictatorship. I mean, this was a a ruler who who ruled um, with an oppressive, you know, uh, hand. Uh, there weren't necessarily citizens; they were subjects. He he plied them with oil wealth, but they really had no um, buy-in to his government. If Donald Trump's um, administration said, "Okay, Fred, you're in charge of the whole Libya situation." Obviously, America can't do everything, like you just said, that it's up to the Libyans themselves to get their act together. So there's only so much the U.S. can do. But if you were somehow in charge of diplomacy or the military or everything, and you had the whole, <laughs> all the power of the United States, what would you do, Fred, in order to try to help Libyans along to kind of bring stability back to their country? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a daunting uh, prospect. That's why I like being in the think tank world. But I, I think... You know, I mean, look, I when I speak to diplomats, to aid workers, I mean, they they really emphasize that America has enormous tools of development assistance, um, U.S. aid. Um, you know, Libyans are are still, you know, very grateful for the type of outreach that the late ambassador Chris Stevens did, and we're talking about people to people outreach. I mean, helping the Libyans with education, um, with citizenship, with developing their media. Um, with women's rights. And so these sort of people-to-people um, contacts and assistance can be enormously empowering, even when you don't have a, a strong government in place. And so the problem now is we don't have a diplomatic presence in the capital, but we can still do these sorts of, of initiatives outside the country. One thing um, you know, I would recommend is we need an ambassador. We, we don't have an ambassador right now. Um, I think America should put more diplomatic muscle in terms of helping and managing the diplomatic process between Libyans and external powers, whether it's the Arab powers or the Europeans. So America could play an important convening role. Under the last administration, America had a special envoy for Libya, and that really signaled that the Obama administration took Li- Libya seriously and because in, and appointed this special envoy who did a lot of shuttle diplomacy. So, you know, managing the regional context, I think, is important for America. The military tool, I mean, obviously, this is a tool that America often defaults to, and we have to use it very carefully. I mean, we, we tried in the past to train a Libyan army, and that didn't um, go well. Um, so we have to sort of, I think, hold back until there's um, a political consensus, until there's stability. Of course, right now, the, the mantra is counterterrorism. The, the Trump administration has been uh, conducting drone strikes in Libya. You know, that, uh, I think, is one dimension. But, you know, it just cannot be the sole lens through which we, we view this country. We unfortunately need yeah. another Ambassador Stevens. And I think many people didn't really realize just how much of a blessing he was for both the United States and Libya. Absolutely. That came across in, in, you know, the account of nearly every Libyan I spoke to. Yeah. And it definitely comes across in your book, uh, The Burning Shores, Inside the Battle for the New Libya. Last question, um, Fred, is in your crystal ball, where do you see Libya going in 2020 and beyond? How optimistic are you? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I want to be guardedly optimistic. I mean, it's, it's hard to be sometimes. I mean, there, there are, I mean, as the UN report um, really specified, I mean, this is a country in, in severe turmoil and severe crisis, uh, human rights abuses across the country. Um, Libyans are leaving in droves. You don't have basic services in the capital. Um, there are some bright spots in the tr- in the sense that oil production has rebounded, so they have this enormous resource at their disposal. The trick is figuring out how to manage it effectively, and and they've got to tackle the the corruption. I think the country could experience more simmering uh, instability. I don't think it's headed for a, a complete Somalia type implosion, but it's going to be a hard slog. Um, something I've been impressed with is the resilience of, of Libyans. Um, and the fact that it's a small population, I think, can be a blessing. It's you know, six million people. There's this sense of, of intimacy among different people. You've seen instances where Libyans have, have walked up to the brink of conflict or, or I mean, severe c- catastrophe, and they've pulled back through 
um, through mediation, through um, social mediators like tribes. So it does have this built-in um, resilience. And I think that's grounds for, um, for guarded optimism. That's a good note to end on. I really appreciate your time, Fred. And I wish you the best of luck. Do you have any plans to go back to Libya in 2018? I hope to return to Libya again. If you want to learn anything about Libya, certainly in the last uh, five, 10 years, um, the Burning Shores book that you wrote is a perfect summary of, and detailed summary. You definitely go into a lot of detail about exactly what happened, all the different players. And so for anybody who wants to try to understand this situation, I think, I guess we can end it on that point, which is, I think a lot of people don't realize how connected Libya and America have been for over 200 years. It was, as you point out, the first time that the Marines went out overseas to intervene somewhere was in 1805, 200, oh, more than 200 years ago to unseat a troublesome Libyan ruler. That's right. That's right. And then, of course, we returned uh, 200 years later. Yeah, absolutely. There's there's a long history between our, our two countries. And we also had the largest overseas uh, military base in the world. It was once home to that as well. So Libya has is, is, is been a partner and a... And for, for the United States for a long time. And, and I think a lot of people don't even realize that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And thank you for, for taking the time to highlight it. And that concludes this episode of the Wander Learn podcast, where we explore travel technology and transformation. If you'd like to see the show notes with links to what we talked about, or if you'd like to comment on the show, or if you'd like to ask me a question, then go to wanderlearn.com and click on the latest episode. If you'd like to connect with me, just remember F Tapon. That's my first initial and my last name. F Tapon is the username I use on all social media. You can also get to my website by going to ftapon.com. Here's one last reason to remember ftapon. If you like what I do and want to get rewarded for supporting my projects, then go to patreon.com slash, yep, you guessed it, ftapon. That's where you can pick up some sweet rewards for as little as $1 a month. And remember, subscribing to the WanderLearn podcast helps, but downloading each episode helps even more. Please share the podcast, review it, and sign up for my newsletter at wanderlearn.com. This show was edited by Rejoice Tapon 
The music was composed by Eric Stratman. This is Francis Tapon, encouraging you to wander and learn.